to Martin James here. So before he continues on with his presentation and his talk, I'd like to do a, a brief introduction. Um, Martin James is the author of the fantastic book When China Rules the World. It's sold over a quarter of a million copies worldwide already. Um, he's soon to release his second edition, and it's completely different, basically, from his original publishing. It's, uh, in his own words, it's half, basically half a new book, and it's coming out in paperback very soon, so if you're interested in what he's talking about today, or interested in what China is developing and what the issues that I have, then please have a look online or in a bookshop. Um, he's actually, his role, um, apart from outside of writing books, is actually he's a visiting senior at Ideas at LSE, the London School of Economics. He's also a visiting professor at Tsinghua University, which is amazing considering it's in China and <laughs> it's, it's really far away. Um, he's also a fellow at the Transatlantic Academy at Washington, D.C. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Martin Jakes. Some sort of distant 
uh, rumble of it, uh, impression of it. Um, but the real underlying problem is that in the West is that um, 200 years of ascendancy, global ascendancy, have taught the idea that at the end of the day, uh, Western society is a universal measure. It is the universal model that the process of modernization is essentially a process of westernization, that there is only really one type of modernity, and it is Western modernity. In other words, China, as elsewhere, will end up like us. Carry on dreaming. It won't. China has never been like us. It isn't like us. And it's never going to be like us. And so this is why uh, uh, in the West um, we always call China wrong. Uh, we make projections, we make predictions, and they don't come true um, because we don't understand it. And this is a very, very serious um, problem. So um, I think that uh, what I'm going to explore uh, in this talk are these two questions. Uh, firstly, China's rise, and, third, and secondly, China's uh, difference. I'm going to start with China's difference, because you know, unless we can start thinking about China in a conceptually different way, we're not going to be able to make sense of it, and we will persistently uh, misunderstand it. Now, I want to offer to this end four building blocks uh, for understanding <coughs> China. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, China has been a nation state for roughly a hundred years. Now, of course, anyone who knows anything about China knows a hundred years is not even a pinprick in, in Chinese historical terms. Uh, China is at least 2,000 years old. Here is the, roughly speaking, very crudely the borders of the Qing dynasty at the end of the warring state uh, period. And you will already see in 221 BC that the boundaries of uh, the Qing are not that hugely different from the boundaries of eastern China. Um, and if you move uh, to the next dynasty, Han, which is still over 2,000 years ago, uh, you will see uh, that actually uh, the Han, the Han, the, the boundaries of the Han Empire were not so far away from what uh, uh, Eastern China is. And, you know, the vast majority of the Chinese have always lived in the eastern part of China uh, rather than uh, the western uh, part of China. Now, what follows, follows from this is that those characteristics which define China as China, which give the Chinese their sense of identity, don't come from the last hundred years of the information state. They come from the 2,000 years plus, Chinese like to think of themselves as often, they'll say, they're 5,000 years old. But they come from that long millennial history of China as a great civilization. That's the reference points for the Chinese. It's not nation, it's civilization. So the characteristics, for example, are very, very unusual. We'll come back to this conception of the state, uh, of the family, uh, of Confucian values, of an ideographic language, of customs like Wang Shi and ancestral worship and so on. All of these things come from the civilization of here. And so here we have a very important difference between China and every single Western nation. And that is the sense of identity in a Western nation overwhelmingly, not necessarily exclusively, overwhelmingly is actually a function of being a nation state, their sense of national identity. And that is not true of China. So we could say it like this. China is a country constituted on the basis of civilization. Whereas Western countries, be they European nations or the United States, obviously, or Canada, are countries constituted on the basis of nation being uh, a nation uh, state. 
So I would define China primarily, it's not that it isn't a nation state, it has some of the characteristics of a nation state, uh, which is acquired over the last hundred years, but primarily it's actually a civilization state. And uh, it's a civilization state, I would say, for three reasons. One, the longevity, I've just been talking about that. Two, that it so happens, because it's not necessarily the case with civilizations, it coincides, civilization state, uh, state boundaries, uh, broadly speaking, uh, tend to coincide. And the third reason is the sheer physical and demographic scale of China, which gives it its other characteristics um, as, a, uh, as a civilization state. I mean, you know, this is a country on a scale which is, makes it much more diverse uh, than Europe. Uh, we think of China too often in rather homogeneous terms, uh, rather centralized terms. China isn't, it's never been like that. You can't, you can't run a country of this scale and diversity on a highly centralized basis because uh, it's impossible. So China is both diverse and in lots of ways very decentralized. You know, it's not true that we're all happens from Beijing. Provincial and city governments, both in the imperial period and today, have always had a great deal of authority. So, um, okay, so uh, my uh, point of departure is that China can only be understood primarily as a civilization state and not as a nation state. That's the start, starting point. Now, you might say, well, okay, uh, it's, that sounds a plausible argument, uh, but what does it mean? Does it mean anything in practice? Now, let me give you two examples of what it means in practice. The most important political value for the Chinese is unity. Actually, the greatest difference between Europe and China is not the time of the Industrial Revolution, which is very important to say negative consequences of China. It's actually the fact that 2,000 years ago, while China, when China began the process of unification with the victory of Qin, uh, at the end of the warring state period, Europe went in exactly the opposite direction as the Holy Roman so the default mode, as we all know, of Europe is a multiplicity of political units that we today call the nation states. China, on the other hand, went exactly the opposite direction, and the default mode of China is unity. And it is extremely important for China to maintain the unity of China, because it's about the unity of civilization, of the civilization. And the civilization is the touchstone uh, 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 characteristic uh, of, uh, of China. And what goes along, by the way, with this sense of unity is also stability. You know, this emphasis of stability is not just something that's uh, cooked up in Beijing by the, by the government. You know, the Chinese have um, placed a great premium on the importance of stability because it goes along with unity, and they know historically what the consequences of China being disunited can be. Because some of the worst periods in Chinese history, and there have been lots of them, uh, have, come, uh, have broadly coincided coincided with these periods of, of this unity. So that's the first point. And by the way, you know, do you know why Mao is so much more popular than Deng Xiaoping in China? Which he is. Uh, the reason is because Mao's great historical achievement was to put China back together again. He reunified China. He reconstituted, the, he, he expelled uh, the colonial forces, whether they're Japanese or European or what have you, and uh, he re-established uh, re the sovereignty of China, and he uh, reconstituted the state, which is a very fundamental institution, far more fundamental in China probably than any other country in the world, uh, to make a it, it, so sense of what it is and its well-being. Now, the other point I want to make, the other example I want to give you, apart from unity, about being a civilization state, is this. Remember Hong Kong? 1997, the, uh, the, the handover of Hong Kong from the, the colonial power of Britain uh, to China. And the Chinese constitutional offer in the basic law was one country, two systems. Now, I'm absolutely certain that barely anywhere in Britain, for sure, but in the West, maybe not so many people in Hong Kong, uh, understood what was really involved. But above all, they probably didn't believe that the Chinese meant it. They probably thought, well, when the Chinese get their hands on Hong Kong, it will become just like the rest of China. Well, 13, 14 years later, actually politically and legally, which is what two countries, one system meant, 
Hong Kong is a different today from the rest of China, as it was then. Yeah. Whereas the Chinese really did mean it. And we didn't understand it. And we didn't understand it because we don't understand China. Because China is a civilization state, not a nation state. Now, the web, and it's a, in a way you can see this, look, German unification, <coughs> 1990. Uh, how was it done? It was done on the basis, essentially, of the disappearance of East Germany and the reconstitution of unified Germany on the basis of the federal republic. Because that is a nation state mentality. One nation, one system. That's how we, as nation staters, as it were, think. But the Chinese don't think that. Because you cannot keep together, hold together, rule, govern a country of this scale and diversity on the basis of one country, one system. It's never been possible, either in the imperial period or the present period, the communist period. It requires much more diversity. So it was natural for the Chinese to propose one country, two systems, because that is the nature of what China is. It's a civilization requiring a great deal of systemic uh, diversity. So, um, so you begin to see when you glimpse it like this, and I'm going to return to some other points that illustrate how fundamental this distinction is between being a civilization state uh, and being a nation state. The only other thing I want to say about this is that um, uh, I think this characteristic of China will become clearer, not less clear, will become more pronounced with time, not less pronounced. Um, Lucien Pai, who I think is uh, he was a very fine writer on China, who died several years ago, Professor Harvard, he said something like this, paraphrasing it. He said, um, China, um, um, China is a civilization masquerading as a nation state, obliged by its own weakness, at the end of the 19th century, to conform to the, something like the disciplines of the European-based international system. Uh, China, it was China's weakness that led to the situation. Uh, and I think as China becomes stronger, then it will express its historical and cultural characteristics uh, more strongly. Okay, so that's my first point. China is a civilization state primarily and not a nation state. Only second really. My second point is about China as a uh, uh, the Chinese history and uh, the, the tributary system. Now, as, as, we will, as you probably know, um, this may or may not work after my. But I'm sure it will. Well, at the. Um, the as you probably know, this large parts of East Asia, um, by which I mean, for example, apart from China, the K Korean Peninsula, Japan, obviously Taiwan, and these are given in modern uh, terms, uh, parts of Indonesia, which is part of Java, and Indochina, uh, as well as uh, uh, parts of Central Asia, were part of the tributary system. Um, which was a China-centric system, which operated for many thousands of years. It started at least during the Han Dynasty, if not actually rather earlier. And it was uh, its hierarchical system. It was based on Chinese, uh, based on the fact that China was overwhelmingly dominant in demographic and economic terms, and was also far more advanced politically and culturally than its neighbors for very, very long historical periods. And, uh, uh, and it was largely a symbolic system. Um, the rulers of other uh, 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 kingdoms and, and so on would give tribute uh, to the emperor every whatever it was by the Qing, by the Qing or Ming or whatever it was, um, calendar. And I suppose the spine of it was a recognition uh, that they had to recognize the superiority of the Chinese. Um, now, at the end of the 19th century, it came to an end. Uh, and it came to an end because, A, China was increasing in 
Fribourg, at the uh, latter period of the Qing, and secondly, because of the arrival of uh, European, especially British, also French, colonialism, and also Japanese uh, colonialism. And that marked the demise of the tributary uh, system. Now, if you look at this, this is a very interesting chart, actually. This chart is uh, not all the countries of East Asia, but many of them. Many of them. And uh, they are the proportion of exports from the various countries going uh, to China uh, as a proportion of their total exports. And uh, you'll see absolutely dramatic changes, especially in some of them. I mean, the blue line is 1995, and the green line is the first half of 2010. Uh, if you went back uh, to 1990, they would be even more dramatic, because Taiwan would have been roughly zero, and South Korea would have been roughly zero, about less than 1% in both cases. But you'll see now that Taiwan sends nearly 40%, 45% of its exports to, uh, to, uh, to China. And uh, everywhere, there's a real, I mean, in a, in a very short historical period, tremendous rise in importance of the Chinese market uh, for uh, all of these countries. And if you look at this, this here, um, if uh, the blue line is the proportion of exports from uh, Asia, excluding India, that go to China. And it's pushing a quarter. I mean, this is a dramatic transformation. Absolutely dramatic. Um, most of these countries, by the way, I should say to you, most of these, um, most of these countries, but not all of them, China is the most important market, including Japan. <coughs> uh, uh, China's well past America uh, as, uh, as a destination for uh, Japanese uh, exports, uh, for example. Now, what I think this is telling us, think of one more. Um, what, what this is telling us is that uh, the region, East Asia, now the largest economic region in the world, larger than North America and larger than Europe, is becoming, is being reconfigured. It's being reconfigured as China central. Once more, as it was for thousands of years during the period of the tributary system. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this process is continuing apace. Uh, I've given you the figures for exports. But if you look at Chinese uh, overseas investment, which is growing, as you probably know, fairly quickly, over half of it, uh, or around half of it, goes uh, to East Asia. If you look, and I'll come back to this, at what's happening to the renminbi, the renminbi will, I think, over the next few years, become the probably the dominant or the majority currency in the settlement of trade within uh, East uh, Asia. Um, and of course, there's also cultural flows and so on that are uh, going along with some of this. So actually, what's happening is very, very rapidly in historical terms. This region of the world, which is the most important region of the world, you know, if you want to understand, if you want to understand anything about the future, don't look at Europe, don't look at North America, look at East Asia. This is what this is prefiguring what the future is, um, and it is being rapidly uh, restructured. Uh, and I think that the output, the product of this, will be a new kind of interstate system uh, in the region. Now think of it like this: uh, prior to 1900, um, the tributary uh, it was organised on the lines of the tributary system. From 1900 to 1950, it was essentially a colonial system, apart from Japan and Thailand, everywhere in some degree or other was colonized, uh, plus a bit of West Valley. Between 1950 and 2000, it was essentially a West Valley system. From 2000 onwards in the 21st century, I think it will be a different kind of interstate system. And I think that what we will see is in some degree or other elements of the past uh, being re-articulated into the new system. Why? Well, because I think China, China is going to be so big, so weighty in the region, so um, so central to everything that happens in the region uh, that it will that elements of what used to be in uh, happen in terms of relationships uh, will uh, once again uh, uh, be uh, uh, reasserted. Um, 
And so, uh, 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 now what that will be, I'm not saying there'll be a return to the tributary system in any simplistic way, I don't think there will be, uh, but I think that elements of it uh, are likely to return. And I think, by the way, I mean, I don't know whether you're following this or, you know, but the events in East Asia are very interesting over the past couple of years with the attempts by the Americans and the Obama administration to reassert itself within the region and find its place because it lost out heavily in the last decade, trying out under the Bush administration. But one thing, that needs, one thing that needs to be borne in mind is that America is a, a rapidly declining economic presence in East Asia. This is an absolutely fundamental point. That any restoration of America's mission in the region, if you look at what's happening at the moment, has basically been about security policy. It's been about military presence. It's been about its naval presence within the region. Because China is increasingly important and ultimately, I think, dominant uh, economically uh, within the region. And that will have all sorts of implications for it. But it's its political influence, its military influence, and so on. Now, the third uh, cons concept I want to offer you concerns race. Um, subject. Uh, okay. Now, Everyone knows that China has a population of 1.3 uh, billion people. But uh, not many people probably are aware that over 90% of the Chinese uh, think of themselves as a one uh, Now, this is so different from the other world's most populous countries, India, the United States, and the East, and Brazil, all of which think of themselves as high population. Now, you might say, well, look, it's obvious that China has historically no generation. It's inconceivable that it wasn't populated, especially in the eastern part of China, where the vast majority of China goes, by many, many different places. True. That's true. But the Chinese don't think like this. Now, why don't they think like this? Why do you get this extraordinary conception, uh, uh, racial conception of what China is in Europe? Uh, well, let's go back to the See, I think. Putting it crudely, there were two processes which led to this development of this kind of overarching conception of Han identity. Han identity. The first is this, you know, it, got, it takes us back to the civilization state. Okay? This is where, again, the civilization state, fundamental concept of understanding. Over a very thousands of years, but certainly two thousand years, but actually longer than that, this part of China existed as, broadly speaking, one political space. And over that long period, uh, uh, through wars, through occupation, through uh, assimilation, uh, through absorption, through uh, government resettlement, nothing new about that. It, uh, there many imperial regimes, uh, 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 conducted uh, resettlement policy. Um, the, the sense of difference, the physical differences, linguistic differences, and so on, uh, that existed and, uh, 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 and made people feel different were gradually uh, narrowed to the point where the, increasingly they felt the things they had in common were more important than the things that divided that they were distinctive. And alongside that process, because ultimately, um, although the Chinese and the Japanese tend to think that uh, uh, race is a biological concept, it's not, it's essentially a cultural concept. Uh, a long historical process going back literally many thousands of years of the development of a very powerful sense of uh, China, Chinese cultural identity. I mean, this goes right back to the first development of sedentary agriculture, the first in the world along with the fertile present, um, and then the development of early forms of state, um, no accident, Confucius, most advanced thinker on government, right in two and a half thousand years ago at the time uh, of the Greek uh, philosophers. And then, you know, if you keep moving forward, then this is some extraordinary creative and effervescent periods, uh, the Tang dynasty, the Song dynasty, part of the Ming dynasty, even part of the, the Qing dynasty. You know, China was a, China didn't have one period in the sun. It had several periods in the sun as well, periods where there was not much sun at all. Um, and so this gave the Chinese their sense of uh, identity. Uh, 
Actually, the Chinese, for the Chinese, this sense of cultural identity, if you say Europeans, the European mentality and the American mentality, the Western mentality is about, um, well, it's about various things, but aggression and belligerence and expansion is very, very important. The calling card, I think, of the Chinese, which makes the most, most important, is this sense of their culture and cultural identity and their, and their civilization identity. But it's, it's not just a cultural identity, it's an ethnic, it's a sense of ethnicity as well. It's an ethnic, it, it's women, it, 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 it unified uh, conception of uh, ethnic and cultural hubris, uh, if you want. Now, what were the great advantages? Undoubtedly, the great advantage of this was that without this notion of had identity, which unified so a large uh, part of the Chinese population, it would have been impossible <coughs> to hold a country of this size and scale together. I mean, this, in a way, is uh, China is an anachronism because most of the empire disappeared. The Chinese empire didn't, so you have to explain why it never disappeared. And I think, essentially, the heart of that is that now. Silly little Westerners after 1989, Tiananmen Square, oh, you know, China will go the same way as the Soviet Union and it will split up. Nonsense, it was never going to split up. The Soviet Union, one of the fundamental reasons the Soviet Union split up, there were various reasons, but one of the fundamental reasons was less than half the population were Russian. That was never going to happen in China. Never going to happen. What's the disadvantage? Well, the disadvantage is I think that China and China have a very weak conception of cultural difference. I mean, you can see this in the attitude towards the Uyghur and towards the um, Tibetans. The two groups which are most different, if you like, from the Han, don't see themselves as Han, the Han don't see themselves as, see them as Han. Um, and really, the, the, the notion of the Han is that everyone ultimately should be like them, you know, in China, that they have to raise their level to become like the Han, which historically is actually what has happened in China. That is actually the process by which, you know, every country has its process of ethnic construction. We don't talk about it, we should talk about it, we talk about the politics and the nation states and so on, we don't talk about this sort of question. Like America has its process of ethnic construction, you know, to do with slavery, to do with, um, to do with the destruction of the Merry Indians and so on. Well, China has its, its, its way of having uh, done this. Of course, this, the, the, for me, you know, the West always going on about the problem of democracy in China. Uh, is that doesn't, I'm not coming back to this moment. That doesn't concern me as much as this question, uh, which is the Chinese, this very powerful sense linked to this of Chinese uh, superiority, which could have been the um, Right, now the fourth, uh, so that's my third question. My fourth question, my fourth concept, is the state. Now this is where the Westerners think they've got China absolutely taped. Okay? No democracy, no human rights, no legitimacy. Now, we need to start here. The, re the, the relationship between the state and society in China is very different. <coughs> to that in any Western country. Now we think in the West that the legitimacy of the state is a function of democracy. We have to lose it in that. But we've come to think that almost that defines whether a state is legitimate or not legitimate. Now, if you look at Western societies, it's obvious that this is this is beyond the point of a now position. It's not that it hasn't got a lot of significant amount of truth to it. But if you look at Italy, for example, you know, which has more has had more elections than I've had hot dinners, the Italians are always voting. And yet the Italian problem is constantly being produced ever since the Risorgimento, which is that the Italian state lies at the Italians like the Resorgimento was only a half successful project. So that's why Italians don't pay taxes, or large numbers of Italians don't pay taxes, but they don't, they think that the state is to be dodged rather than to be subscribed to. Now, China. Sorry, Mr. Jack, um, can you just check your microphone still on? I can 
ゃべるうちの国平面の。Natural break. <laughs> Could be called arse inspection time. I'm <laughs> afraid the organisers couldn't afford a new set of batteries. <laughs> right. So, um, my proposition is this. The, the Chinese state enjoys uh, more uh, enjoys more legitimacy and authority in the eyes of the Chinese than any Western state. Now, I know this is, flies utterly in the face of how we think about China predominantly in the West. But I think this is the case. I mean, this is some figures, by the way, here from Tony Seish at uh, Kennedy School at Harvard. And uh, he's carried out a series of uh, sur opinion surveys over, uh, over these years. And, you know, you get these extraordinary figures in terms of the levels of satisfaction uh, with government. These far exceed anything you'd ever get in the US. Now, if, if, if you accept that proposition, um, pit stop. You promised me these will last, eh? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can hear my finger. Can you hear my voice? Um, now, if this is true, uh, can you hear me? Uh, if this is true, uh, it, let, 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 take me on trust that this is true. What are, what are the reasons for it? Well, I think the reason for it is that the Chinese see the state quite differently.